Come on, let's give Jesus an ovation of worship. Man, I'm glad each and every one of you guys are here, especially those of you who are first time. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and along with my sweet, amazing wife, Jennifer, uh, we get the honor of being able to pastor here. And last weekend, um, on Saturday morning, we had our, our fifth child, and uh, pretty excited about it. I'm a little glassy-eyed, because I have had no sleep, so but I feel good, and uh, I'm excited about what God is doing. And uh, we don't just meet here, we meet at Memorial High School, and then we, we join in with our church over in Katy, our Katy campus. Let's give them a great big hand. Everybody watching online, and those of you on Facebook Live. And also, last weekend, if you were in this service, we had a little bit of a challenge, um, a little bit of a scare. A sweet little girl named Josefina um, started choking, and her mother, Cassie, where you at, Cassie? Where you at, Cassie's over here, so uh, where you at, where you at? Oh, right over there, okay. That y'all were sitting right over here and you guys are doing fine. Josefina's good and uh, our team did a great job taking care of her last week. So I just wanna thank you guys for being here and that was scary last week. We were talking about the power of God and then uh, all of a sudden we needed him and he came through. And I wanna give our medical team a great big hand for handling that so effectively, so good. We're talking, this, this whole series is about fresh air and when you have a moment when you realize you, you just need a little fresh air. Have you ever had that moment where you know like, I just need a break? Or maybe you have kids. How many of you guys have kids? And the Lord bless you. You have kids. It doesn't matter how old they are. You can be like, listen, I just need a second, all right? And if you have little smarty pants kids, they'll be like, one. And then you're like, no, 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 I need a minute. Can you just give me a year? I mean, you're gonna grow still, I just need a year. I'll be back, I'll still be your mama, but I need a year. I just need some time, I, I need a second, I need a break, I just need some, I need some fresh air. We've all had those moments, and we believe through the power of the Holy Spirit, God gives us the ability to every day, all day, in any given situation, have the fresh air that can only come from God, so that even in a tough situation, I can still have peace, and I can still have hope, and I can still have reassurance and joy, some of you, uh, maybe you haven't been in church long, or maybe you know somebody who seems to always have a good spirit. You ever met somebody who just, they always have joy, and you wanna go like, what, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like they're, they're always happy, and I believe, firmly believe, that more believers should exhibit joy. We shouldn't look like everybody else. We shouldn't be the ones who celebrate our sarcasm. Mm, I might need to preach on that a little bit then. <laughs> no amens. That means I just saw pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Sometimes we look just like the world, and our heart and our response is not supposed to look that way. We're supposed to look like people who have something greater to look forward to than what I'm going through right now. But we all have those moments. That's hard. It's easier to talk about it and to tell you, have faith in the moment than to actually have faith in the moment. And anything, anything can kind of throw you off. We have, like I said, we have five children, which creates, which creates some stress every now and again. And when, when we only had three, uh, Jillian turned one, and apparently it's very important, especially in some mothers, that we celebrate that first birthday in a humongous way because obviously that child will remember whether you did or didn't <laughs> celebrate that really big. So we gotta spend some money, we gotta have a bounce house that that child can't even get in, but the older children can. Um, we have to have two cakes, not one, but two. We have to have one for everybody else, and then we have to have another one. Y'all know what the other one is? Yeah, it's a smash cake. I had no idea what that was because it wasn't a fad when our first two daughters were born. We just had one cake. But now we had to have a smash cake. And if, you're, if you don't know what a smash cake is, let me help you understand what a smash cake is. A smash cake is mostly for social media, okay? And so, <laughs> let's just be real. Like, you put a little cake in front of your kid and then you try to coax them to grab it with their hands and like stuff it in their face or like smash, better yet, smash their face in it. And so you'll be like, Okay, and everybody's gathered around and you want them to blow the candle out and they, they can't even say mama yet, so they can't probably do that. So you blow the candle and you remove the candle and you're like, get it, eat it. <laughs> and then you get a little bit and put it on their mouth, like eat, like eat sugar, it's good for you, you know. <laughs> you're gonna want this the rest of your life, you know. And then if they, <laughs> if they don't smash their face in it, like you have the camera, you kind of look around and you're just like, bam, and then like take a picture, you know, like. Your kid's afraid of cake for the rest of their life and they don't even know why. They're like, see cake, and they're like, oh, why? You know? 
So we had this party, we had a smash cake, we had the bounce house, and my wife had asked me, would you like to grill? And your boy's from Louisiana, so yeah, I like to grill, because um, I know how to flavor, and I know how to savor, and I know how to use the Tony Cesares, and I know how to use a little crack in there, and a little Holy Spirit, and make it super good. I apologize for the drug reference this early in the morning. Um, it's a joke. But listen, if it's your first time, this is pretty much as good as it gets. So it's like, if you're waiting for it to get, it's not gonna get better. But, um, so I'm ready, and I got the grill out there. It's a gas grill. I'm rocking, I'm rolling. There's all kind of neighbors there. Kids are running everywhere. And all of a sudden, while I'm grilling, like, the grill goes out. You ever had that happen? And like, that will, te that will test your Holy Spirit right there. You'll be like, right now, in the name of Jesus. Lord, you answered Elijah's prayer with fire from heaven. Right now, I need to grill these burgers in the name of Jesus. Nothing happened. My wife comes out. She's like, hey, how's it going? Burger's almost ready? I was like, no, they're not. And then we had a full-on whisper fight. And if, if, <laughs> if you're married in here, then you know what a whisper fight is. It's like, we gonna fight. We just don't want anybody to know about it, right? We gonna fight, you know? So she's like, well, what is going on? I was like, well, if I knew, I would tell you. What's wrong with your girl? I don't know. I asked him. He didn't say nothing. He ain't doing anything. Well, don't be a smarty pants. Well, don't ask me stupid questions. I'm telling you right now, don't point at me. I will point at you. I'll, I'll point back. And like we're trying, so from the back, it looks like this right here. Like we're directing some kind of weird choir, you know? She's like, make it happen. I was like, you go back inside. She's like, you don't tell me what to do. It's like, in Jesus' name, go inside. I love you. All right, sweetheart, it'll be done in a minute. <laughs> Obvious problems with the grill and my marriage. And so we, you know, I have to, you have to then go, the grill won't work, so I have to go get the, the George Foreman grill and run a plug around, and just run, plug it into the garage and then act like I meant to do it, like I start them on the grill and finish them on the George Foreman. It's a tactic. People are like, wow. My neighbor comes over and he's like, having problems with the grill. I'm like, walk away, Todd. Walk away. I don't even know you that well, man. It's just a problem. And then I hear shrieks from behind me, and the George Foreman grill is throwing the breaker, and the bounce house is imploding upon kids, and parents are acting as if somehow it's going to eat their children. Like, get out, Donnie. Get out while you can. Like, Donnie's going to be fine. I flip the breaker and turn it back on. You keep playing, Donnie. It's plastic. Don't be afraid of everything in life. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to be real, you know. This I was mad, you know, I was not Pastor Jeremy in that moment. I was just Jeremy. <laughs> Sometimes I'm Jeremias and I start speaking Spanish. I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> After it's all said and done, one of my buddies walks up and he goes, hey man, he said, uh, I know you had enough gas in the tank and that earlier the burners were working fine. He said, but I think I know what the problem is. And I was like, well, where were you about 25 minutes ago? <laughs> my wife has already left. Thanks, bro. She didn't. We're good. But, but he said, uh, it's a problem between the tank and the burners. There's a piece called a regulator. And he said, if the regulator's not working, working properly or malfunction or reads something wrong, it won't allow the gas to get to the burner. And I had a moment, because I'm a pastor. And I was like, hold on just a minute. Mm -hmm. You telling me there was enough gas in the tank? He said, that's what I'm telling you. I said, you're telling me the burners were created to burn that gas. But there was something wrong in the light. There was a kink in the regulator. Hey. So what you're telling me is I got to figure out what the problem is between the gas and the grill. Hey, the grill. If you've never been to a church like that, you just... You're missing life. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what the problem is between the power of God and its manifestation in your life. Because you and me were created to be carriers of the anointing. We were created, our purpose was to glorify and magnify God and be his hands and feet on the earth. And it was to carry joy and hope and peace and kindness and goodness and long suffering and self-control. And you guys get quiet when I start talking about the fruit of the spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit means I'm connected to the root of the Spirit. So if there is no fruit, I need to go check the root. And the fruit is love and joy 
and peace and patience. Mm, somebody said patience. <laughs> Touch your husband, say patience. I'm playing, don't do that. <laughs> patience and goodness, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, self control, things that are absent from a lot of church people's lives. Self control. Self control means I can put down Facebook and I don't have to religiously check it all the time because somebody might have liked something. I'm connected to the power so it shows up in my life. And there are many of us that the grill has gone dark so we're not fulfilling our purpose. We're still connected. It's just not getting from one place to the next. The power is just as strong as it was yesterday. The, the word says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if anything's changing, it's you and me who's changed. So the regulator for you and me, I have a revelation on it. The reg I'm telling you, this is one of the most important messages I'll ever preach to you. The regulator for you and me is, is one little simple thing called worship. Worship is the regulator. Everybody say, worship, worship. is my regulator. Worship decides how much power of God is active in your life. You and I were created to worship. worship. Worship is a part of our communication. And maybe you're not a believer in here. Maybe you're agnostic or you're atheist. And hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. We want you to keep coming. I mean, we, it ain't no trick. We're trying to convince you, okay? That's the whole thing. But, but even if you say, well, I don't worship. What are you talking about? I don't worship. I'm, I don't worship anything. But you do because you're created to worship. You worship, you worship everything. We, we're created to worship. Think about how many things you love. I love cheese. Like, I love chips and queso. I love it. I don't know. I love it. Like white queso. Love it. Yellow queso. Love it. Queso with meat. Love it. Chili con queso. Love it. Queso burrito. Love it. Love it. I love Guadalajara. Right down the road. Ah, I've got a man that red velvet tres leches. Love it. I get excited. I have a spiritual experience with red velvet tres leches. It's the three milks. <laughs> Father, son, son. I mean, I'm just saying. Holy Spirit is red. That's ridiculous. Not doctrinal at all. But the way you and I respond to one another is a form of worship, right? We're created to get excited about stuff. Well, I'm not emotional. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> See? <laughs> How many of you guys like, you like sports? You have a sports team. There's nothing like going to a professional um, football game. You know, we get all excited, especially whenever um, our pastor at our football, like when Pastor J.J. Watt comes out, he raises his hands. We all look like we respond. We get excited, right? And then he gets knocked out of the game. We're like, why? We don't even want to come back, you know? You get excited. Like, there's nothing. Like, if you think an NFL game is important, go, go to a college game. That's for real. Like, how many, are we getting Aggies here? Where you at? Like, whoop, whoop. That's what you do all the time. Like, whoop. Any Aggies here? Do you, do you, do you think? Whoop. Yep, whoop. That Aggie on our staff. Anytime we say Aggie, whoop. I'm like, hey, be quiet. Chill out. We're trying to talk about something. Anybody a Longhorns fan? We got Longhorns here. We got some Longhorns here. Any LSU fans here? Okay. okay. So I did that for a reason. That's where the crazy people are right there. That's, that's my people is who that is. That's my, we know. All right. We don't even spell go right. It's G-E-A-U-X, right? We don't even know. Go-ax. Well, that's what people are like. What does that mean? But there's nothing like going to like a seven-year-old football game. You talk about people getting insane. They'll tell everybody they're not emotional. I'm like, run, Billy, run. You don't knock my son over. Like, hey, lady, chill out. There ain't no scouts here. Your boy's seven. But they get crazy. Why? Because you and I were... We were created to communicate emotionally and worship. We get excited about things. We get fired up, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just as long as you worship him more than anything else. Worship, the, the definition of worship is not coming into a service and lifting my hands. That's part of the action, but the definition of worship is obedience. That's true worship. To, to give my body as a living sacrifice. 
holy and acceptable. So that's what Paul said, true. That's true worship. Whenever I say, all that I have is yours and all that I am lives to glorify you. So there is nothing that is greater than you in my life. That's why we sing, Jesus at the center of it all. We don't say, Jesus at the top of my list. Because if he's at the top of my list, then that means he could possibly be at the bottom. And Jesus ain't at the bottom of any list. He's always at the top. So he's either at the center or he's not a part. Mm, 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 mm. So, so worship aligns us with his will. Grace is given freely. You don't have to earn it. Because if you had to earn it, we would systematize it and end up selling it and end up making you feel so bad and you do all the things that I tell you to do and then you earn the grace of God. And there are some churches that do that and some of you were raised in those churches and now you live for God out of guilt and not even out of grace. You cannot earn it. It is a free gift. We are saved by grace through faith, period. But the favor of God and the blessings of God, a lot of them come through obedience. This is the conundrum between works and not works. You cannot be saved as a result of your works, but works will be a result of your salvation. So when I am saved, then I wanna walk in obedience to his word. This is why we have connect groups so that you can get around other people who can help you grow in your relationship with God. You ought to be in a connect group. This is why we have a growth track. Why? So that you can learn about what the word teaches so that you can grow, so that you can discover your purpose because your purpose is not just to come and warm a seat at Hope City and make us feel good because we had a lot of people in church. That is not the purpose. The purpose is for you to discover the unique thing that God designed you for and go out and make a difference. That's the purpose. So we want to teach, but worship helps us align our life. Worship, there is nothing greater for me. I'm giving you the key right here. This is the secret. People ask me, how are you so happy all the time? I'm like, first, I'm not happy all the time. But most of the time I am, and my wife will tell you, even in hard times, even in tough times, do you know why that is? Because I learned the secret. The secret ain't a secret, it's worship. It's all throughout the word, it's worship. It's obeying the word of God. I get into a room at times and I just, I don't even know what to say. I open my, this week, this happened to me this week. In fact, uh, Friday night, I opened my computer, which I was studying, I was just praying, I was trying to you know, make sure that I knew what I was gonna do this weekend, talk about, and make sure that I was ready and locked in. I opened my computer and I had a lot of decisions to make. We got a lot of decisions to make, y'all. You know why? Because the vision is huge. We, we, we need buildings, plural, not singular. We need buildings. We need property. We need more campuses. There's about 1,500 people watching via video right now at Katy Campus. Come on, somebody. Lives are being changed over there. There are other places close to your house that we need to start a campus. We're getting fired up. So I got a lot of decisions to make, and I'm praying, and sometimes it gets overwhelming. You ever been overwhelmed? Anybody ever just raise your hand if you've been overwhelmed? You know, I'm going to tell you the secret to not being overwhelmed all the time. Here's the secret. is to stop focusing so much on what you are going through and start focusing where I am going to. And so what helps me do that is worship because if I, sometimes I pray and worship is even a part of my prayer. It's all requests. Oh God, please just, oh, just help me figure this out. I don't even know what to do. And so I open my computer. I go to YouTube. You don't even, I don't have any, you may say, I don't have any worship music. YouTube's got you. <laughs> open YouTube, go to or Spotify, whatever. People have already made playlists. Search Elevation Worship, search Hillsong, search Bethel, search Andre Crouch, I don't know, search something, search Commission. Your boy was listening to old school Fred Hammond on the way in, and some of y'all don't know Brother Fred. Brother Fred was, he was taking me in on this morning. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord God strong and mighty. See, I don't know. I was bumping on the way, and I was like, Driving by people are like, that guy's crazy. I was like, mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> worship. So I turn the music on and I just stop worrying about my problems and I start glorifying him. And all of a sudden my problems shrink at the glory of my God. And I say, you know what? My problems may be temporary. My issues may be right here. They're finite. They're on this earth. They're, they're something that I can see, but I'm gonna go ahead and begin to worship and praise God for what I cannot see. And if you never do anything else, I'm not living for here, I'm living for there. Worship reminds me, it aligns me. There's, there's something important about alignment. When I align my will, how many of you are parents? Your parents. When your child aligns their will with your will and they're honest and it's true submission, what does it result in? It results in favor. 
if they're disobeying you, you still love them. They're still your kid, right? You'll still, you're, they, you ha they have the grace to live at your house. They have the grace, okay, I'm, I'm gonna let you eat something, but you ain't gonna go where you wanted to go. Why? Because you are out of alignment, you're in disobedience. But when they obey, what happens? Oh man, he's been doing good. I think we ought to, dude, I think we ought to go above, I think we ought to go above and beyond. Let's surprise him. He's doing so good. Why? Because he's living in obedience to the word of his father. And when you begin to live in obedience, you align your life. I learned more about alignment spending one afternoon with Dr. Miles Monroe than I had ever learned in my whole life. Dr. Miles Monroe's a pastor, preacher, teacher, a prolific trainer, speaks all over the world and spoke to congresses and, and uh, countries and presidents and prime ministers, went home to be with the Lord way too soon. But I met him a few years ago and I love this story. I'll tell it till I die because it, it changed my life. I picked him up at the airport. He flew in on a private jet. It was awesome. I flew, and I, I, was, I had a black SUV. I was picking him up. I wore a jacket. I talked into my sleeve like the eagle has land. There was no, nothing even in there, but it, it looked awesome. Like I had to buy sunglasses just for the moment. Moment, like, look, like look around like I had something, you know. He got in the truck, I drove him, he spoke to some business leaders in South Houston, south of 45 at, at uh, 5.30. And then at seven o'clock, I had to have him, 59 North, I had to have him at a church because he was gonna speak there. And so at 6.30, your boy's still talking to the business leaders on 45 South. <laughs> now, if you don't know Houston, Maybe you're watching from somewhere. You're watching on Facebook Live. Let me help you understand what happens in the city of Houston. Y'all need to pray for us, and here's why. Because at about, at about 4.38, the Holy Spirit says no, and the Holy Spirit just leaves. This whole city turns into chaos. About 7.38, the Holy Spirit comes in and restores order. <laughs> Except for on 290. That's just always territory we're trying to take right now. We need to start a campus in the middle of 290. Like, just set up a tent. Like, y'all drive through, have church. Y'all need Jesus. How many of you guys live up 290? You live up there right now in Jesus' name. And there's a whole, but we might need to start a campus up there in Jesus' name, help y'all. So he gets, he finally finishes talking. I'm like, that was amazing, doctor. And I take him out and I put him in the truck and I'm getting ready to take off. And he says, wait just a minute. He's like, <sighs> he said, I believe we have a police escort. I'm like, bruh, I don't need a police escort. Your boy from Louisiana, I'll bow and Luke Duke. I'll jump a ditch, put some mud pyres on it. I'll go anywhere, bro. But I didn't say that. I was like, okie dokie, doctor. The Houston version of Chips pulls up on their motorcycles. Dude says, hey, stay with me. I was like, winking the gun. All right, bye now. He flipped his siren on, peeled out. We pulled like three G's getting on 45. We're doing 90 miles an hour on 45 North, and it was legal. I was like, thank God. I've been praying to do this my whole life, and I'm, I'm obeying the law of the land. <laughs> Traffic's parting like Moses parted the Red Sea. And then there's one dude, he's in a late model Impala, and he won't get out of the way. You know, it's one of those cars that used to be a cop car, but it's no longer fulfilling its destiny. <laughs> if you own one of those, I bind the spirit of deception that's on you. Take the light off of the mirror. Take it off. You know you don't even use it. Just deceiving us, pulling up behind us. We're like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> Drives by as a mother of four. She's eating a taco. I'm like, <laughs> speed past. I'm like, this dude ain't, he's not, he's going like 30 miles an hour. Won't get out of the way. The officer gets furious, slides his bike sideways and slaps the back of this dude's car. He, he like swerves all over the road, pulls over. The officer says some super nice things to him as he's going by. Dr. Monroe never even looks up from his Bible. And he goes, did you see that? <laughs> like I saw my life flash before my eyes when I saw. He said, what you have just seen is the difference between power and authority. In your vehicle, you have all the power that you need to go anywhere that you want to go, but it is your alignment with the authority in front of you that takes you places that you cannot go without it and removes things from you that other people around you cannot remove. You know what I did? I was like, ah! that's what, I, that's what I, I really didn't do that. I didn't do that. I'm not gonna embarrass my family. I was like, that's amazing, doctor. <laughs> but I learned something. When I'm aligned with the proper authority in my life, 
which is King Jesus, then he can make a way where there is no way. He can grab a doorknob that doesn't exist and open a door that's not there. And everybody else is looking, saying, how are you feeling joy? And I say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And though I'm going through pain, I'm not looking at the pain. I'm looking at the promise. How do you do that? Here's how you do that. Worship. 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 God responds to worship. What are you saying? Are you saying I have to get all crazy? No, I'm not saying you have to get all crazy. I'm not super emotional. Yes, you are, but I understand what you're trying to say. But you do, you do need to worship. You need to learn how to worship. Well, I don't like to, I don't like to do all that. Some of y'all get crazy, and, and some of y'all do get crazy. And we have to calm some of y'all down. But I'm not talking about here. Corp, this is corporate worship. I think it's important for us to come. And the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some do. I think we ought to come and worship together. But I think the most important form of worship in your life is by yourself when you're all alone. And in that moment, you begin to say, God, you are good. And your mercy endures forever. And I don't even know how to do what I'm doing right now. But I'm just going to tell you, I love you. And, and I don't know what to say. So I'm going to say, I love you again. And, and I, don't, I can't say all the words that the pastor says. So I'm going to open the book of Psalms. And I'm just going to start reading stuff that you are and I'm going to study worship so that I can perfect my worship and make sure that I'm worshiping you in the way that you desire it's the love language of God and worship gets a response from God it does all you got to do is read the scriptures it gets a response from God worship worship is obedience everybody say worship is obedience so when I obey what God has told me to to do then, then then that results in the power of God God gave a promise to the children of Israel. He said, this is the promised land. It's the land that is promised. And whenever they walked in, Joshua and the boys rolled in, and they come up to Jericho. And the Lord says, see, I've given you the city. The problem is the city uh, is still inhabited by the enemy. So there's a promise. And Joshua says, well, what do you want us to do? He says, march around the city. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody does that. That's a terrible battle strategy. Strategy. March around the city. Yeah, do it for seven days, once a day. And on the seventh day, do it seven times. And and Joshua understood the power of worship so strong that he commanded all the people. He said, march around the city in silence. That was not a command of God. That was an addendum that Joshua added because he knew that we have an inclination to negativity when God is, is responding to worship. And sometimes our prayer time is more filled with negativity than it is with worship. We keep telling God why it's not going to happen, and he keeps saying, if you'll worship me, it's already happened. You just got to keep walking forward into the answer that I have already provided. So they're marching around the city. They're marching around the city. They're marching around the city. They're marching around and being quiet, marching around the city, thinking, this is ridiculous. But they're obeying, and on the seventh day, on the seventh time, what do they do? They shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Try that. That's a form of worship. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, it's a hallel. A hallel is an exuberant praise, almost goofy, and that's where we get the word hallelujah from. Hallelujah! Doesn't even make sense. Sounds weird. But whenever you worship, I'm going to tell you be crazy, but whenever they worship, it got a response, and God tore walls down that they could have not torn down. God respect. This is why David was a man after God's heart. Musicians, come and play so that I'll quit preaching. <laughs> worship gets a response. David perfected worship. He's a shepherd kid, man. He's overlooked by everybody, and he learned how to worship. In fact, it was his calling card. Whenever Saul needed somebody, one of his men came and said, hey, um, David, uh, there's a kid. He's a Bethlehemite. He's from from the house of Jesse, and he's a worshiper. He knows how to worship. He's out in the field by himself with a bunch of sheep learning how to play a guitar and worship it. Do you know anybody can play an instrument? You know what the oldest instrument is? I'm going to preach a whole message on this. You know what the oldest instrument is? Nisi, give me something. That's, thank you. That was solid. The oldest instrument is a drum. Anybody can play a drum. You know, you can play a drum. Do you know how you, you can play a drum? Y'all play drums. Some of y'all just, you, just, you make a sound by tapping. David learned how to worship. And it was because of his worship that he had the favor of God. He became a man after God's own heart. And you find it all through the Psalms. He learned how to worship in the midst of pain, in the midst of failure. He failed God, committed great sin, had a man killed because he slept with his wife, didn't want anybody to find out. And immediately after he paid the price for that, the Bible says he washed his face. He anointed himself 
and he entered into worship. You hadn't failed so much that you can't worship God. He loves you and he loves it when we worship. Why? Because when we worship, we're aligning ourselves with him. And when we align ourselves with him, he gets fired up because then he can accomplish the purpose that he's called you to. A couple weeks ago, uh, in fact, if you missed Fresh Air series um, part two, you need to go back and listen to it. I talked about um, Psalms chapter 23. It's one of my very favorite Psalms in the Bible. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Everybody say, my shepherd. He's my shepherd. The power of the verse is in the ownership of the shepherd. He's not your shepherd. I mean, he is, but he's my shepherd. He's not just a shepherd. He's not just the shepherd. He's my shepherd. So when he's my shepherd, I shall not want. That is, a two, two, that is a twofold meaning. That means he's gonna give me everything I need. And it also means I'm not gonna want anything that my shepherd doesn't want me to want. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. I always get this picture of a, of a, of a rolling field, beautiful field, rolling hills, waist deep grass and sheep just eating till they're fat and falling over and lying down. He makes me to lie down in green. Lord, I don't want to lay down, but okay. <laughs> but if you actually study, and I challenge you to go and do that, there are theologians who have went to that area of the country in Israel and they've studied. They ain't no green pastures. It looks a lot more like this. I want to show you a picture. It looks a lot more like this. That's where they graze sheep. That's where David is grazing sheep. That's modern day. That's a shepherd right out there leading his sheep and grazing in the green pastures because it's a, a dry climate. It's an arid climate. There's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of foliage everywhere except for a couple of months in the year. And so what is that saying? That's saying, listen, he's a shepherd who can find what I need even when I can't. So, so I wanna show you what he finds. The shepherd finds stuff like this right here, where the condensation drips off of the rocks into the ground because of the cool in the evening and the heat of the day. And it creates foliage, it creates grass right in the, in the midst of rocks. So you and I would look at a field and say, there is no grass on that field, but a shepherd would look at that field. And as long as the sheep are following him, he will lead them in rocky places, in tough places where other people cannot find sustenance. And he's saying, listen, you'll give me everything I need exactly when I need it. It may not be everything I want, but it will be what I need. So I don't have to know where the resources are. I just have to know where the shepherd is. And the shepherd is my source, and he will help me find the resource. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. Everybody say, he leads me. He leads me. So the question is, are you being led? Or are you being driven? In a lot of areas of our lives, we feel driven to do this and driven. To do this. It's not necessarily a bad thing in some areas, but just make sure that you are led of God. Because sometimes I can be led, I can be driven by myself. The Holy Spirit leads you. The enemy drives you. What Satan cannot stop, he accelerates. Because then your life is out of control. You ever grown too fast? Something happened too quick and all of a sudden you're not ready for it. That's why the Lord leads you. It takes his time. Verse 3, please. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Next verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Everybody say the valley of the shadow. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I love this verse. He says, I'll feel no, fear no evil. Here's why. For you are with me. You're with me. So if you're with me, that's why it ain't the valley of death. Because if you're not with me, it's the valley of death. If you're with me, it's the valley of the shadow of death. You know the difference between the valley of death and the valley of the shadow of death? The shadow. You know what causes a shadow? Light. So if I'm in the valley of death, but he's with me, all of a sudden there's light where there shouldn't be light. There's light in a valley that was meant for death. Now there's a shadow. And if there's a shadow, that's because I'm following the light. You keep walking towards the light, and you'll walk right through the valley of the shadow of death. Because he's with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I love this next verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
Everybody's got enemies. Whether you like it or not, you have enemies. And some of them are people. Some of them are, are spirits. The, 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 Satan doesn't like you. And if you believe in God, you have to believe that there's a devil. Some people, it's amazing to me that almost 50% of Christians don't believe that there's a devil. You need to check the word. There's an enemy. He uses people a lot of times, but you have enemies in your life, especially when you're following Jesus. So you want to see your enemies? Start following Jesus. Start worshiping Jesus. They'll come out of the woodwork. But I don't have to worry because he prepares a table. I want to help you understand this. If I walk, I'm going to walk through enemies either way, but if I walk through enemies and I'm following Jesus, it changes the landscape. Oh, man, I hope I can preach this how I feel. You prepared. I need some enemies. I got some enemies. Come on out here, enemies. These are enemies. These are actually really, really good, good dudes, but they're enemies today for this purpose. There's a bunch of y'all. Look at the enemies. They're enemies, and they prepare bad things. So y'all say, we got some bad things prepared. We got some bad things prepared. That did not, did not sound bad. I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you to amp up the bad just a little bit. Get after it. We got, we got some, some bad things prepared. Okie dokie. I'm scared of the Backstreet Boys. Oh. I'm just playing the sheer amount of skinny pants on this stage right now. Um, I'm just hocking. Skinny pants tell you whether you can wear them or not. You know what I mean? Um, they got something bad planned. I should have said that. I won't say that next time. They got something bad planned. But if I'm following Jesus, come here, hippie Jesus. If you, missed, uh, if you missed a couple weeks ago, Jason was the hippie Jesus. And uh, so you stop. So if I'm following Jesus, then I'm aligned with him. That means sometimes he's going to lead me through hard places. He's going to lead me through the valley of the shadow of death because that's the only way I get to my purpose is through some pain because it's in that pain that I go into the process that prepares me for the promise on the other side because if I don't go through pain, then I won't be able to appreciate it on the other side. Ain't nobody appreciates something good like somebody who's been through something bad. You know what I mean? If all you've ever had is good, it's hard for you to look at somebody and say, oh, no, 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 God's been good to me. Listen, I've been through some hard times. I've been through some tough times, and now I can say God is good all the time. It's brought me a mighty long way. All right, you can go back over there, Jesus. So I'm following Jesus, and what he does is he rolls into the enemy's camp. They've, they've got a plan. They're henchmen. Y'all got to look mean. You don't look mean. Look mean. That you, there's, no, there's no possible way for you, Brody. It's impossible. You're the sweetest person in the world. Look mean. Come on. Look mean. Come on. Like. So yeah, that's better. Yeah. God. Are we teaching our young people nothing? He's got a bad plan. He's going to take you out. And God rolls up and goes, hey, I know. I get it. I know you think this is your territory. But the book of Isaiah says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Do you know what that means? When the enemy comes in and says, this is my territory, God goes, no, 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 boom, flag. That's what, the, that's what a banner, that's what the standard means banner. He doesn't even have to fight a battle. He just raises the flag. He's like, yeah, I've been here. This is my property. So you're in my territory. So now what you meant for evil, I'm going to turn for good. And you no longer work for you. You work for me. And I'm going to prepare a table. I need to prepare a table. So I need some help preparing a table. In the He prepares a table before me. What does that mean? That means before I ever get there, he's already been there. He's already staked his claim on that property, and he's prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, you and I want the enemies to go away, but God says, no, 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 no. I need them to stay there because I'm going to use your enemies to create uh, revelation in your life, to create perseverance in your life. You, you can't have heat without friction. So I'm going to put a little friction in your life so I can heat it up and change you in the process. And so now, <laughs> he uses the enemy to serve his purpose in my life. And he says, hey, I need, uh, I need one of you enemies to come over here if you don't mind. Oh, you've already got your, your, uh, you've already got your, uh, your, your apron on. Because what the Lord will do is he'll take that enemy and he'll change his identity. And he'll say, you just get right down here because he's coming and he's tired. He's exhausted. 
You, you don't realize what he's already been through just to get here. And y'all thought you were going to take him out right here, but you're not going to take him out because I'm going to use this situation to increase his capacity. And here's why. Because the entire time I might have been going through pain and heartache and I've been walking through the valley of the shadow, but I'm, the whole time I'm doing this, I'm just worshiping in that moment. I'm just, I'm just, I'm letting that regulator keep that power flowing in my life. Paul said this, Paul said these light and momentary afflictions are working together to bring greater grace in my life if I focus not if I look not on the things which I see but I look on the things which are eternal what does that mean that means affliction works for me if I don't focus on it if I focus on the God who is over it all he will use those bad things and he'll position it in such a way that by the time I get there it's hurt it's pain it looks bad but God goes no 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 I've already prepared a seat for you right here in the midst of your enemies and now what was bad I'm gonna use to sustain you I'm gonna use to strengthen you I'm gonna use to get you ready for the journey that I've called you to go on here's what I want you to understand oftentimes in the moment that table don't look like a table and the pain does not look like a process that's bringing you to the promise it simply looks like pain but it's when you trust him through it and you still worship him and you still praise him i'm preaching like i feel it and, and you still give him glory and you give him honor even in the midst of pain that you'll look back over it years later and you'll say man if i had to i didn't even realize he was feeding me in that moment and preparing me for now he was giving me sustenance in that and I thought I thought that it was heartache but it was in that situation that I learned how to hope I thought that it was pain but it was in that situation that I learned I've got a promise I hear you over there I hear you you're not gonna trick me you're not gonna trick you're not gonna trick me with your gospel words listen here's what I'm trying to tell you and I know I'm preaching kind of old school It. all of this happens because of worship David learned how to worship he ends this whole thing with saying I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever no matter what I got through no matter what I fail and I fall through and I sin I'm going to get up and I'm going to worship no matter if I feel unworthy and I do if I feel inadequate and I do I'm going to worship in the midst of it and it's because of my ability to say you are greater than what I am going through and if I continue to go through it blessed be the name of the Lord and if you deliver me on the other side blessed be the name of the Lord and if I live as Christ and if I die is gain blessed be the name of the Lord and it's because of that that it increases my capacity and goodness and mercy follow me goodness and mercy where are you at goodness and mercy we talked about it a couple of weeks ago I got goodness and mercy coming along it's amazing to me how goodness and mercy are always bigger than the enemies and so I'm following Jesus and, and here's what mercy's for mercy's for whenever I fall I falter mercy catches me it says you're gonna be all right and goodness listen you got to understand the Lord gives you grace Okay, so he gives you, um, come here, I'm going to redeem you. You're no longer an enemy. <laughs> but leave your apron on, you're still a servant. I preach. The Lord gives me grace. Okay? All right, now, you get to decide what to do with that. And many of us walk through life hanging on to everything we got. Holding on so tight, it's all about me. Even our prayers, all about me, all about me, all about me, all about me. And when you do that, he can't watch what happens. He can't fit. And he's not going to waste his resources on somebody who can't appreciate it. So he just gives you enough. And he still loves you. Saved but not set free. Believers who are bound. But I want you to watch. I want you to watch what happens whenever. Come out here. Whenever I learn how to worship. So now I'm following him. I learn how to worship. So just worship. Just okay. So now I say, thank you, Lord, but it's not mine. It's all you. <laughs> it's, it's, your, your, your grace is so sweet, but it's not mine. 
I, I, I thank you for, I didn't earn it, so I can't keep it. I just, I trust you. And then, and then he gets excited and he goes, okay, cool. I want to show you something. I prepared a table before you in the, in the presence of your enemies. And it begins to bless you and begins to strengthen you and begins to sustain you. And when I walk away from that table and I'm moving on through my life, goodness continues to follow me. Now, goodness, I want you to show them what happens with goodness because goodness follows you. Whenever you're following Jesus, goodness, goodness follows you and goodness just hooks you up. Goodness just gives you whatever you, whenever you need it, goodness gives it to you. And here's why. Because, because it comes to me to go through me. And now I'm living in the overflow. And if somebody's close to me, they're going to get a blessing. Why? Because it ain't mine. All that I have is yours. Everything that I got is for the glory of the King. So I don't live as unto myself, but as unto the Lord. Keep going. Keep going, goodness. Listen. And sometimes it takes, now don't stop. Sometimes it takes some time for you to look back and realize he's been pouring blessings on you since day one. But you just got to keep worshiping. Just got to keep putting him at the center. Just got to keep trusting him. Y'all got to pray for your boy. I got a couple more services to preach, and I don't know if I can do it. God's good. Listen. I know I get excited. I know some of y'all are not super emotional. Hey, 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 hey. Uh, come on. He's single too. He's saying. The blessings come down. And I want you to notice. I didn't, I didn't use them all. I didn't use them all. So now, what, what, what I don't hang on to. What I don't think is mine. S somebody else, sorry for that, ma'am. We have insurance. <laughs> what, I, what I don't hold on is mine. He regenerates. That's what we want to be. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to be. <laughs> all that I have is yours. So all over the room, just everywhere you're watching, just lift your hands right now. Just lift your hands. Maybe you're uncomfortable with that. I'm just going to ask you to do it just for a second, okay? If you don't know what to do, just act like, like you're in a robbery right now, all right? It's the international side of submission. Like, hands up, you know, unless you're Chuck Norris. You're going to do this right here, right? Hands up. Many of us, we don't even know how to do that. It's very hard for us. I'm not telling you you have to do that when you come here. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is just a lesson. How do you feel when you do this? I mean, I'm empty-handed. I got nothing. I surrender. I submit. I yield. I can't do it. I'm at your mercy. I'm at your... Wait, when somebody pulls a gun, I'm, I may not like it, but I'm at your mercy. What am I doing? I'm saying, listen, my family is more important. My, listen, just, just my life. Just take whatever you want. I love how God doesn't demand that. It's never a gun. It's always grace. And when I understand submission brings blessings. Submission brings favor that I can go through life open-handed and say, I worship you. There is no peace like the peace of knowing that God is good even when situations are bad. That even when I don't understand it, I'm just going to still praise you and I'm going to still worship you because my worship is not dependent upon my situation. But all over the room, let's, let's just lift our hands and pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, you're the only one who can save me. So in this moment, I'm asking you to save me. I worship you. I adore you. I magnify you. I must decrease so that you can increase. Let my life bring glory to your name. I'm asking you, Jesus, to be the Lord of everything, to be the Lord of all, to get glory through my life. I will live for you and no one else. Jesus at the center. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give him an ovation of worship and pray. God, you're worthy. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the very first time today. Or maybe you rededicated your life and you, you know you've been far from him. Either one, we want you to text HOPE to 77453. Here's why. Not trying to capture your information, trying to give you information. We'll text you one time with resources that are going to help you on this journey. The most important thing that I can do is equip you to become a disciple. Jesus saves you. It's my job to help train you. 
We don't want a church just with a bunch of people. We're not building a crowd. We're building individuals. A lot of people count by thousands, but Jesus counts by one. And you matter. And he wants to use you to do great things. And I'm excited about what he is going to do. I want our church. Here's your homework this week. This week. Obey what the word says. And worship him in all you do. Just make sure he's at the center. So do a little evaluation of your life. And say, is he at the center of my life? And if he's not, then start doing your best to get him there. You can't do this by yourself. You'll have to ask him to help you. And he will. Our growth track helps with that. Connect groups help with that. This is my prayer for you. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you and makes his face shine upon you, turns his countenance towards you. And this week, I pray that God gives you peace. Do you receive that? Let's give him an ovation of worship. God, you're good. And you prepare a table before me. Come on, let's give him an ovation. God, you're good. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, our prayer partners will be down here. Use all the X's. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.